Good afternoon, class. We're going to jump in at <clears throat> chapter eight today uh, and talk about corporate level strategies. But before we jump into that, let's go back and talk just a few minutes or actually review just a couple of things we learned in chapter seven. And again, to me, chapter seven is an interesting chapter. You're talking about international markets. The authors talked about why corporations and companies and entities are interested in international markets. <clears throat> and it doesn't really matter what country you're talking about. Companies look at, at expanding and getting into the international or the global markets because it's increased access to customers. In theory, you can reduce cost. And again, most companies are driving for that economies of scale, trying to drive that long run average cost down by adding more units to the supply function. And also, it's somewhat of a diversification of business risk. At least, that's the view of a lot of corporations. Challenges, as the authors talked about, you've got political risk, you've got economic risk, and you've got cultural risk. And you can think about a lot of companies in the global market trying to go into countries, especially maybe in the Far East or South America or the African continent, uh, Central America. Even in places in, you know, Western Europe, <clears throat> you've got issues with political risk, uh, economic risk. You know, what's the dollar going to, how's it going to stand up against the euro? Uh, cultural risk. It's extremely difficult for some individuals in some companies to actually function in another culture because of the cultural risk are just so foreign to them that it makes it, uh, almost a, a, a non-starter for them. And then uh, the authors talked about our, our, our buddy Michael Porter's diamond model. And, you know, he's looking at demand conditions. He's looking at factor conditions. So, you know, what's the demand look like in another environment or an international environment? What's, what's going to be the access to the factors of production in that uh, international market? Looking at related and supporting industries and then also uh, looking at the, at the company strategy, their, their structure, their, I guess, um, appetite uh, for rivalry. And then types of international strategies, the authors outlined those very nicely for us. Um, you've got a multinational corporation and like a lot of academics, they go into the, the acronym. So it's an MNC, multinational corporation. Uh, you've got a multi-domestic strategy, you've got a global strategy, you've got a transnational uh, strategy. So uh, different types of international strategies depending on the company. Uh, options for competing in international markets, most companies like to, to try out in the export line. So export some of your products, see if there's an appetite and a particular international market for your for your products, and if there is, then you can you know can think about maybe creating a wholly owned subsidiary. You can think about franchising. You can think about licensing. You can think about joint ventures, uh, strategic alliances. Uh, just a lot of different opportunities that a company can take. Uh, again, depending on their appetite for risk uh, and their future forecast of how successful they think they'll do. <clears throat> and that kind of wraps us up with chapter seven. Now we're going to move into chapter eight. And we're going to talk about selecting corporate level strategies. And the authors start out talking about concentration strategies. And a concentration strategy is it's defined in your textbook, actions that companies use to try to compete successfully only within a single industry. And they outline three different types of, of concentration strategies for us. And they do a pretty good job of, of, of outlining them uh, then providing some uh, a definition around the, the concentration strategies. Then the first one <clears throat> is market penetration. It's an attempt to gain additional share of existing markets using existing products, advertising to attract new customers. And when you're talking about market penetration, most companies will take this route. They're going to uh, expand their advertising budget. They're going to um, maybe dump 
uh, additional funds into R and D, research and development in a market. So they are scoping out the market, trying to figure out uh, is it going to make sense uh, to to penetrate or, or expand the penetration in that market. And they're also looking at how they're going to expand that penetration. And typically, it's it's grabbing new customers. Uh, when they talk about advertising to attract new customers, think about <clears throat> uh, think about actors and athletes. They are constantly in in advertisements, you know, trying to pitch this product or pitch that product. Uh, you've got uh, companies may tailor their advertising to focus on minorities because they may they may feel that is an untapped market of new customers for. Them. One of the op, one of the examples they gave in um, the textbook was um, the the together the marketing strategy that brought Sheets, the, the gas station company, and Budget Rent-A-Car together. So looking at different advertising strategies to try to grab those new customers if they're going to take a concentration strategy of market penetration. <clears throat> the second one they talk about, it's, it's more along the lines of, of shifting populations. And when we're talking about shifting populations, we're talking about market development trying to sell existing products within a new market or markets. So um, we, we're not talking about existing markets like we were in market penetration. Now we're talking about shifting to new markets or new um, opportunities to sell your product either in new markets or a shifting market. And you see a lot of um, retail organizations working with um, some of your grocery store chain. So uh, when you talk about entering a new retail chain, think about Starbucks. Not only can you buy Starbucks at, uh, you know, at the local Starbucks store, the kiosk in the mall, or now you can find you know, Starbucks coffee and I see it in Publix, you know, they you can see it in Kroger's, um, you even see it now in places like, I know I don't want to, I, I hate to call them discount, but you see it now in places like Marshalls and TJ Maxx and Home Goods. You also not only see the, the beans that be the pre ground beans, the beans you can buy and grind yourself, but now you see these bottles of <clears throat> pre made Starbucks coffees that are in the grocery shelves. And Starbucks is using this as an opportunity to develop new markets, to get into new markets, to get into the kind of the discount type markets, the retail grocery store chain type markets. Uh, you can also, companies, especially corporations, when they're looking at these concentration strategies, they're actually <clears throat> thinking about entering new geographical areas. Um, if you're familiar with the East Coast at all, you know, then, then one of the examples they gave in the text, I think, was Tasty Cake. I mean, this was a staple, little, uh, you know, kind of like cupcakes and donuts and those type of breakfast type, or at least you think of them as breakfast type items. Um, for a long time, we're just kind of concentrated in that Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, <clears throat> maybe northern Delaware, but that part of the, of the, of the East Coast where uh, you know, surrounding that Philadelphia market. Uh, but now you're seeing Tasty Cakes, they've expanded out and they're trying to tap into some of these new markets that have been uh, controlled by Hostess and uh, some of the other intimates, some of the other types of, of uh, producers that have been generating a lot of sales from these. And again, I consider them more breakfast type carbohydrate, you know, baked goods. But Tasty Cake is making a strong move to, to expand it. Um, also, if you're familiar with that, you know, Pennsylvania, or at least that kind of East Coast corridor, you've got Wawa. The kids grow up there, you know, telling out, hey, let's go hang out at the Wawa. Uh, but Wawa is a huge, huge uh, retail kind of stop and shop, sandwiches, grocery items, you know, you see them, uh, see them along interstates, you see them in uh, some of the, the 
bigger cities and they're trying to expand out. <clears throat> Think about uh, as, you know, it used to be there, there's a, I guess you'd call them a competition to, to Lowe's and Pilots and Flying J's, but you've got Bucky's. I mean, it is a huge gas station, convenience store, sell clothing items, started in, I think, Texas. And now they're expanding all through the Southeast. Um, here in the Nashville area, uh, the closest one, I think there's one, uh, if you're heading out uh, Interstate 40, going to Knoxville. As you get close to Knoxville, there's a Bucky's. If you're going south, uh, especially down 75, you pick up one in Chattanooga, you know, it's south of Chattanooga, about 40 miles. But you see them in Texas and Alabama and Mississippi, all through the southeast, and they're expanding now. They're getting ready to open one in Kentucky. So they're expanding into new markets. in and out Burgers, talking about bringing franchises to the Nashville area. What a burger. Big Texas, uh, you know, in and out with Southern California. What a burger is a big Texas hamburger chain that expanding throughout um, throughout the southeast and working its way up the up the up the coast. Uh, White Castle staple seems like forever in kind of this part of you know Nashville, Kentucky, uh, this this part of the country, and they still haven't expanded as much as they'd like to. But you see. Um, White Castle, you know, in the freezer sections at a lot of grocery store chains, especially on the West Coast. For people that grew up with White Castles on the East Coast, they moved to the West Coast, and it's White Castle looks at it as a market that they can expand to. So you're going to see a lot of probably going forward of these regional staples that are trying to, to expand into new markets through market development. And then you've got product development. Uh, creating new products to serve existing markets. Uh, you've got, I think they use an example in the textbook about McDonald's offering more healthy options. You know, maybe, you know, you see it with McDonald's, you see it with Wendy's. Uh, they offer some salads. They offer, rather than just a fried chicken sandwich, they have, you know, like grilled chicken sandwiches. So I guess they are trying to get into some of the healthier options. Disney has, you know, has years been shifting away from just doing cartoons and animation into kids shows and now into, you know, feature films and uh, then series and those type of movies. So, um, and then you talk about product development. Um, I think everybody enjoys a good donut periodically, and uh, you can go into these donut shops now, and it's it's just not, you know, cake and raised donuts. It's just not, you know chocolate glazed and uh, in your regular sugar glazed. Now they've got, uh, at least in the Buffalo market, a few years ago, they rolled out this uh, donut with bacon in it. And it, it's just, they're trying to develop new products and they're trying to attract market concentration by attacking and trying to grab new customers, either through, um, you know, through one of the three, you know, concepts that we just went through, uh, which one is going to be the best for any particular company? It's going to be hard to tell, but you know, market con you know, market concentration through market penetration is when you're looking at existing markets. Market development, you're talking about new markets, and then thirdly, you've got product development. And you have some companies that, and, and Starbucks is one of them. Starbucks is uh, doing a lot um, in all three of these, you know, concentration strategies. So. I think it's <clears throat> going to behoove a lot of comp a lot of companies going forward if they want to continue to be profitable and continue to be successful. They're have, going to have to start looking at some of these concentration strategies. Always remember, when we're talking about strategic management, it's driven by economic thought. So when you're looking at economic thought and you're looking at the profit function, it's revenue minus cost and through market concentration, if you can drive that revenue higher and control your cost, you stand the opportunity of, of maximizing more of a profit level. Um, and then the, the authors kind of, they kind of waffle back and forth, but um, and I don't want to say it's disjointed, but they start now talking about a couple of concepts that 
especially when you're talking, when you're discussing them in economics classes, tend to uh, confuse students a little. But we're going to talk about horizontal and, and vertical integration. And horizontal integration, uh, the authors point out, it's it's pursuing a concentration strategy by acquiring or merging with the rival. And usually horizontal integration is, is for the most part, um, it occurs through mergers and acquisitions. Acquisition is when one company purchases another company. And a merger is the joining of two similarly sized companies into one company. Um, if you think about mergers and acquisitions, um, Starbucks and Seattle's best. Bank of America and Chase have been merging and acquiring um, other savings and loans banks over the years. And they are becoming, you know, they are huge removes in the banking industry. Um, you've got uh, HP and Compact, um, GMC and, you know, they bought Saab. Uh, and then I drove Saab for years. And until GMC purchased them, uh, and that's the last time I've ever owned a saw because once GMC purchased them, just the quality of the automobile just uh, was just not there anymore. So uh, you're talking about horizontal integration. And again, pursuing a concentration strategy by acquiring or merging with a rival. And again, acquisition or merger is the way that horizontal integration usually uh, takes place. And in a horizontal integration, the company increases production of goods and services at the same level of the value chain in the same industry. And again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but some companies, I, I think it's a small number of companies, can do it through either internal expansion, but the majority of them are doing it with mergers and acquisitions. And when you're talking about horizontal integration, <clears throat> you've seen it over the last few years in wine industry, um, bourbon industry, beer industry, automobiles. Think of all of the, the horizontal integration that's taking place in the automobile industry. Um, you see horizontal integration, you know, taking place in, in hospitals. Uh, here in the Nashville area, you've got HCA, Hospital Corporation of America. They, through horizontal integration, they've acquired a lot of hospitals. Um, and again, mergers and acquisitions are driving horizontal integration. The flip side to horizontal integration is vertical integration. And it's an arrangement in which the supply chain, horizontal, we're talking about value chain. Vertical, we're talking about the supply chain. It's an arrangement in which the supply chain of a company is integrated and owned by that company. Um, think about computers, microchips, processors. They are grabbing those and getting control of them in a vertical integration up the, up, up the supply chain, not out over the value chain. Horizontal is out over the value chain, vertical integration up through the supply chain. Um, Cargill, huge. Uh, huge agricultural, they do other things other than agriculture, but huge in the agricultural industry. They own feedlots, they own grain supplies, they own farmland. Uh, so again, vertical integration, feedstuffs, cattle, hogs, sheep, commodities to the consumer. Also think about hospitals and physicians. What happens when, they, if you think about healthcare, you've got hospitals kind of sitting at the top of that food chain, and you've got the members at the bottom of that food chain or that supply chain. Members are going in to see the primary care docs. The primary care docs, for the most part, refer you to a specialist. If you need surgery, the specialists have admitting privileges at the hospitals. So there's your supply chain in healthcare. There's your vertical integration in healthcare where you have hospitals acquiring um, specialty, usually multi-specialty provider groups, and they're turning them into integrated healthcare delivery system. That integrated healthcare delivery system 
wants to provide you health care from soup to nuts all the way up through that supply chain. They want to grab you as a consumer and hold on to you to ensure that as you come in to see your doctor and the doctor decides you need to be admitted at the hospital for whatever reason, they're going to use those physicians to channel you in um, to the hospital. When I was in graduate school at Ohio State, um, the hospital on campus started these Med First or Med Ohio clinics in the outlying Columbus had kind of a ring around it. And they would position these Med First clinics and they were feeder clinics. You, you know, they were usually open from eight in the morning to eight at night. And it was, you know, urgent care type services. You go in and if they couldn't hang on, they would refer you into the emergency room. And, but they were, when they were referring you into the emergency room, they were referring you into the emergency room at Ohio State. And then the authors uh, continue, as I say, kind of bouncing around a little, but the authors continue and, and talking about horizontal integration. And it's attractive because it lowers cost. Again, we're going back to that economies of scale. One of the, the theories of, of horizontal integration is because you're, you are rivals in that same value chain, you should be able to, to attain economies of scale and take and, low, and lower those long run average costs as you go down, as you add more and more units. You reduce the intensity of rivalry makes the industry more profitable, makes the industry more profitable, but it may not be the best for the consumers. Um, and when you're talking about reducing intensity of rivalry, go back to Porter's five forces models. This is where it's gonna start tying it again. In healthcare, it can lead to higher prices and reduce consumer choice. Because as you start having these integrated systems, physician groups, hospitals, all types of ancillary type services, it's going to uh, maybe not drive healthcare into monopoly, but could very well be driving it into an oligopoly. And it's going to strengthen their negotiation power with health plans, not only with health plans, but with Medicaid, with, with traditional Medicare. And it's going to give consumers fewer choices and in the end of the day, drive up the cost of healthcare goods and services. Um, you have ownership of strategic resources, valuable name brands. Again, Wawa on the East Coast, Tasty Cakes, um, I guess Uts on the border chips. You know, they, they are starting to, you know, they start, you know, coming together in horizontal. So you're, you're taking advantage of those brand names that um, while they are, maybe brand names on the East Coast with Tasty Cake and Wawa, maybe, you're talking about using that brand name and moving it maybe into the Southeast. Um, another attractive um, aspect is the you know, market share that can be attractive. Southwest Airlines um, merged or acquired Air Trans a few years ago, and that got them into some airports. Um, I think it got them into Washington National. That was an airport that they hadn't been able to, to, to get a foothold in. You've got, uh, you've got Japanese uh, that I can't remember. It, it, I think it was like uh, Seven and I Holdings, Japanese firm called Speedway, local gas station chain. See them in Atlanta, see them all through the Southeast. Uh, and then another you know, advantage is access to new distribution channels. Um, they pointed out in their ultimate, you know, UFC and MMA, they go together and now, you know, with strike force and um, they're doing a lot, grabbing additional, mar not only markets, but grabbing additional consumers through horizontal immigration, integration. Remember, talking about in the value chain, if horizontal integration functions in that value chain, uh, kind of some of the, the drawbacks, and you can just look at the stock market as an example. Not all mergers and all mergers and acquisitions are profitable. Uh, the text talked about sixty percent a road market share well or a road shareholders well. Uh, about one sixth of them increase shareholders well. Um, or I guess it said less than one sixth of them, and one sixth is about 
What, 16%? 16%, you know, so a little less, 16% of them only increase shareholder wealth. Uh, why don't, why do so many of them not increase shareholder wealth? The majority of the time, it's the cultures don't match. Now, they may have a similar mission and a vision statement, but the culture is just, they just, they just can't make, it sounds good on paper. And from an economic theory perspective, it sounds good, but those cultures just do not match. A uh, buyer overpays for target company and the buyer never earns back the premium paid. And you see that. I think that is maybe a little more of an issue than, than the culture is not matching. 30 to 45%. Our mergers and acquisitions are undone if by the end of the year, you know, by the end of the day. They just, they, they merge, you know, they go together in the merger and acquisitions. They try, cultures don't match, they overpay, doesn't work out as well, at least as the theory that they had outlined or the strategic plan they had outlined, and they just undo it. They go their separate ways. And then now we're going to flip back again. So we've kind of gone horizontal, vertical. We've done some advantages on horizontal, some disadvantages. And now we're going to flip back into a vertical in integration strategy. We're going to go through it one more time so everybody's clear. It's when a company gets involved in new portions of, of both the value chain and the supply chain. So, But it's mostly the supply chain. Think of it. Horizontal. Think about a horizontal part of your graph. Think about the vertical part of your graph. So vertical is up, horizontal is flat, uh, and it offsets the leverage of suppliers and buyers. And that's where um, it makes the most profitable sense to expand is if you have a situation for a company in which there is uh, excess leverage being exerted by the buyers, and we'll talk about Walmart, because Walmart, I think in the example of one of the in one of the chapters, they talked about Walmart uh, exerting uh, a significant amount of leverage on like Procter and Gamble, or you've got uh, so you, let's say you got Procter and Gamble in the middle, and you've got Walmart up here exerting you know undue leverage. Also, Procter and Gamble's got suppliers down here that are trying to exert leverage, and Procter and Gamble. While Walmart's probably not going to buy Procter & Gamble or, or acquired in a vertical uh, integration, Procter & Gamble may go down and, and, and grab some of their suppliers to minimize that leverage on the supplier side, and that's going to form the vertical integrations because you're, you're moving in, in a vertical, moving in a vertical direction. Uh, entering the domain of a supplier or buyer can decrease their leverage. And that's the rationale that you have when we're talking about vertical integration. You're trying to decrease the leverage that either a buyer or supplier has. And remember, go back to your profit function. Profit is revenue minus cost. You decrease the leverage on the buyer, in theory, you can increase your revenue. If you decrease the leverage on the supplier, you should be able to decrease the cost. And if you can increase the revenue and decrease the cost, you should be able to drive a much higher level of profit margin over the long haul. Vertical integration in conjunction with Porter's five forces models, at least in theory, drives greater profit potential. Companies can pursue vertical integration on their own or through mergers and acquisitions. Um, think about eBay and PayPal. Also think about Apple stores. Apple got tired of selling their computers and their iPhones and their iPads or their products to, to Best Buy and Circuit City. And you know they just went out through vertical integration and, and that was actually through um, an internal expansion, but through vertical integration, they started opening their own stores. Opening their own stores, selling only their own products, training individuals to be more astute when it came to Apple products. Used to, you'd walk into Best Buy or for Circuit City and you'd ask them about a computer and, you know, the guy you're talking to, the computer geek you're talking to there, they know, they know a little about a lot of products. But if you walk into an Apple store, most of those characters working in an Apple store, they are well versed in all of those Apple products and they can give you the particulars and do a really good job explaining each and every one of those Apple products in that Apple store. 
uh, Carnegie Steel. Think you know that Carnegie Steel in the in, in the steel industry. They they controlled all elements of the production process. It increased efficiency to levels never seen before. All companies are the most vertical integrated by controlling all station all stages of the chain. Think about your oil companies from drilling, processing, selling, BP, Exxon, Mobil. They are controlling that all of the, um, I guess, steps in the vertical integration. Um, the 2010, and it talked in the text about this. I'd actually forgotten about it. In 2010, the explosion of the deep water horizon uh, put BP in a lot of trouble. So, uh, and the risk to BP was that they hadn't vertically integrated and they lost control of the quality process uh, through that deep water horizon. So, again, if they had taken a different stand, <clears throat> taken a different uh, approach and a different strategy, they would have been controlling that vertical integration process and had more control over the quality of the processes moving forward. Uh, risk to vertical integration. Remember, we went through advantages and risk and horizontal. Now we're going through advantages and risk or, risk or advantages and disadvantages of a vertical. And new portions of the value chain of the supply chain can force companies into very different businesses. The example they gave in the text is lumber mills and home builders. Might make sense for home builders to vertically integrate with the lumber mills, but it's not going to make a lot of sense for a lumber mill to integrate with a, uh, a home builder in most cases because they're expanding them into new and different businesses. Creates complacency within the subsidiary. Guaranteed purchase of products, why be creative or efficient? So if you're down at the bottom of that supply chain or down at the bottom of the food chain, let's say, let's say you're Computer chips for computers. Hey, you know, HP, Apple, they're going to buy your chips. They're going to buy all the chips you can create or all the chips you can produce. Why be creative? Why be entrepreneurial? Why be concerned about um, increasing the quality of your product, increasing the efficiency in which that product is produced? And then they get into, uh, and, and I I can't remember whether we talked about it in this class or we've tired or it's another class that, that, uh, that's come up in before, but they talk about some specialized uh, integration <clears throat> strategies. And one is backward vertical integration, a strategy that involves a buyer entering the industry from which it purchases goods or services. So that's the buyer in, you know, entering the industry. That'd be like, Walmart entering the industry that Procter & Gamble is the 800-pound gorilla in. Moving back along the value chain and the supply chain and entering a supplier's business, it, it mitigates the supplier leverage and power. Make sense? Computers getting into the computer chip. It's going to minimize you're moving backwards along the chain so it's going to minimize the leverage that the supplier has um, usually it occurs in manufacturing um, you had Ford that went into to the rubber and the glass and the metal uh, industries you had Delta bought refineries to produce their own jet food you had Disney um, they went out and bought ESPN production company for talk shows, documentaries, movies. What you're doing is you're moving backwards that supply chain. We're moving backwards on that chain, moving down the chain. You are minimizing or mitigating the leverage that the supplier has. And in most instances, in a lot of these, it's impacting the factors of production. That we, you know, basics of, of economic thought, especially microeconomic thought, theory of the firm, you're, you're mitigating the impact of, of the suppliers of those factors of production. So that's backward vertical integration. Flip side to that is forward vertical integration. And if backwards was entering the supply market, what do you think? Um, 
is forward vertical integration. Buyers going backwards. Now suppliers going forwards. A strategy that involves a supplier entering the industry to which it supplies inputs. Moving farther down the supply chain to enter the buyer's business. So you're, you know, you're going, you're not, you're going forward in that chain, trying to trying to gain leverage, trying to um, on the supplier side, you're trying to minimize the leverage that the buyer has. It'd be similar to Procter and Gamble trying to minimize Walmart by entering into the um, industry that Walmart sets there as the 800 pound gorilla. Useful in neutralizing the effects of powerful buyers. And again, you had Disney stores, you, you see it in Amazon, you see it in, you know, Fords and Hertz tried it. You've also got eBay and PayPal. Um, they, they go together and form to try to decrease customer concerns. It says, you know, paying over the internet. You've got Apple stores, profit and product knowledge. Uh, you see this forward vertical integration happening a lot. And with that, we're going to stop for just a few minutes. And when we come back, we're going to talk for a few minutes about some diversification strategies. Talk to everybody in a few minutes. <laughs> 